So it's a, it's a great uh, pleasure to introduce um, Liz Valenti, a PhD student in our division for the past uh, nearly four years now. She came from Latrob University with uh, very high recommendations from uh, um, uh, Hamza Putalaka to use to work here, many people know him. And uh, she's been working on uh, two projects, both of them uh, related to the tumor suppressor P53 uh, on the one hand, um, how it functions and how it is activated in cancer therapy, and then the second part on um, how it actually protects us from getting cancer. And um, both very interesting uh, um, results. Uh, the second one is already published. The first one, I'm sure, will be published soon. And uh, the first one relied on uh, getting very valuable drugs from, uh, from Roche and um, actually managed to get uh, the agreement to get these drugs from Lubo Vasilev as we were standing at the 38th parallel between uh, South Korea and North Korea looking into no man's land. So maybe not a bad omen for uh, Liz's project. So <laughs> off you go. All right, hopefully you can hear me. Um, so as Andreas said, today I'll be talking to you about two projects from my PhD and they're both centered around the tumor suppressor protein uh, P53 and how it protects us from cancer. So P53 is a transcription factor. Uh, it plays a major role in the suppression of, tumor form, uh, su suppression of tumor formation and the way that cancer cells respond to anti-cancer therapy therapies. So in terms of P53's critical role as a tumor suppressor protein, this is best evidenced by the fact that over 50% of all human cancers bear mutations to P53 that inactivate its function, and about another 40% bear mutations in components of the P53 pathway, either upstream or downstream. So you can say in about 90% of all human cancers, there's some abnormality of P53 signaling. Uh, patients with Lee-Farmini syndrome uh, inherit a uh, P53 mutant allele, and they're characterised by an, uh, a, a particular predisposition to certain types of cancers, such as, such as lymphoma or sarcoma and breast cancer. In terms of mouse models, uh, P53 deficient mice have 100% cancer incidence, uh, and um, they also come to thymic lymphoma or sarcoma by about 250 days of age. So. P53 uh, RNA is expressed constitutively within cells, but under unstressed conditions, its main uh, P53 protein is maintained at very low levels. And this primarily involves um, an E3 ubiquitin ligase called MDM2, which targets P53 for degradation by the proteasome. In response to various cellular stresses, and these can be, include oncogene activation or DNA damage, P53 is activated via a variety of mechanisms. These primarily involve the inhibition of uh, MDM2-mediated degra degradation of P53, as well as uh, further post-translational -transla modifications that activate P53. Once active, P53 forms a homotetramer and binds in a sequence-specific fashion to the promoters of various genes. And it's said that there's a roughly about 160 P53 target genes. And through this, P53 can modulate activity in a wide range of pathways. And these can include apoptosis, cell cycle arrest and senescence, but as well modulation of DNA repair and metabolism and its own feedback regulation. So my first part of my talk is really looking at which are the critical effector processes that drive therapeutic responses to P53 activation in cancers. So P53 has been shown to have a major role in the way that genotoxic cancer therapies or DNA damage inducing therapies um, kill cancer cells. And this is either via apoptosis, cell cycle arrest and senescence. P53's uh, critical role in apoptosis uh, was shown in studies that showed that when you irradiate thymocytes, um, wild-type thymocytes are very sensitive to this, with 80% cell death observed over 24 hours, while P53 deficient thymocytes are almost entirely protected. P53 was also shown to be essential uh, for cell cycle arrest after DNA damage. These are myeloid leukemic cell lines that have been uh, treated with gamma radiation. They're then incubated in the presence of BRDU, which is a labeled nucleotide, which can be incorporated into the DNA of cells that are actively synthesizing. When you countersain these cells with propidium iodide, you can use this as a way to determine cell state. So you can define uh, the different cell states, either G1 cells that are synthesizing their DNA or cells that have completed synthesis of their DNA and are about to divide. 
In response to gamma radiation, uh, there is a decrease in these S phase cells. And so this is indicative of uh, cell cycle arrest at this G1 to S boundary. Cells lacking P53 are, are, are resistant to this uh, with an, uh, no decrease in the S phase cells observed after radiation. Finally, P53 is incredibly important for the induction of senescence after DNA damage. So these are colon carcinoma cell lines treated with doxorubicin. Doxorubicin uh, interclates into DNA and forms uh, DNA strand breaks. And so in response to this, wild type cells, if you um, stain them for the presence of beta galactosidase activity, which is uh, indicated by this blue coloring, almost all wild type cells undergo senescence in response to DNA damage, whereas P53 deficient cells are largely protected against this. And despite the fact that genotoxic therapies are quite widely used within the clinic and they're quite efficacious, there's certain concerns about their use. And one of the major ones of these is because they induce DNA damage in cancer cells, that they could actually drive acquisition of further mutations, which could lead to treatment resistance. An additional uh, concern about their use is that they could perhaps drive mutations in non-cancerous tissues, and this could result in a secondary cancer uh, arising in the longer term. So this has led to a really strong interest within the P53 field to develop therapeutics uh, which activate P53 via non-genotoxic uh, mechanisms. So while 50% of uh, human cancers bear mutations to P53, the remaining have wild type P53. A large proportion of them act to uh, uh, inhibit P53 activity via um, overexpression of P53's negative regulator MDM2. This leads to enhanced degradation of P53 within the cancer cells and leads to resistance to P53 activation and downstream signaling. It was thought that if you could design a drug which inhibits the interaction between P53 and MDM2, this would drive accumulation of P53 within the cancer cells and activation of downstream signaling uh, resulting either in cancer cell death or perhaps um, cell cycle arrest and senescence. So the forerunner of these compounds were the nutlins, and these were designed by Lubomir Vasilev at Roche in the early 2000s. So these are small molecule antagonists of MDM2, and they bind within a hydrophobic groove on MDM2, which actually forms the site where P53 binds. And so they have a very high affinity uh, for MDM2, and they're able to effectively inhibit the interaction between P53 and MDM2. In various preclinical studies, uh, they were shown to be able to promote the accumulation of P53. So this is a human osteosarcoma cell line treated with nutlin, and you can see an uh, increase in the P53 protein levels. And this was followed on uh, by induction of downstream P53 targets, uh, such as P21 and MDM2. Um, the nutlins were able to um, were also shown to be able to, to inhibit tumor growth or promote tumor regression in a range of tumor xenograft um, studies. And so this is just human lim uh, a human lymphoma xenograft study uh, where you can see that the treatment with nutlin uh, inhibits uh, tumor growth in vivo. <laughs> So this really leads me to uh, what my question was, and this is really to define that in response to Nutland 3A, what are the downstream P53 effector processes uh, that drive responses to Nutland 3A? So because uh, the Nutlands were designed against human MDM2, I needed to confirm uh, that they could antagonize uh, mouse MDM2. And for this, I treated thymocytes uh, with Nutland 3A and then uh, did qPCR and Western analysis. So we can see in response to Nutland 3A treatment, we see a strong accumulation of P53 protein in wild type thymocytes. Uh, and this is then followed on uh, by induction of P53 targets, P P21, Puma, Noxa, and MDM2 at an RNA level, but also at a protein level. Uh, this induction of P50, uh, P53 targets is P53 dependent because you do not see it occurring in the P53 knockout thymocytes. In terms of the functional consequences of Nutland treatment, you can see uh, these are proliferating T lymphoblastic cells treated with Nutland 3A. So in response to treatment, these wild-type uh, T lymphoblastic cells undergo cell cycle arrest with a decrease in these S phase cells. And um, this is dependent on P53 because uh, P53 knockout T lymphoblastic cells are um, protected against this. <coughs> 
Nutland 3A can also induce apoptosis in uh, non-transformed uh, lymphoid cells. And so this, these are thymocytes treated with Nutland. You see uh, they're very sensitive to Nutland 3A with 100% cell death occurring over 24 hours, whereas P53 deficient thymocytes are completely protected. This apoptosis uh, is mediated um, all via the intrinsic apoptotic pathway because when you overexpress this uh, pro-survival um, protein BCL2, which is critical for intrinsic apoptosis, um, these are as protected as the P53 knockout thymocytes. So just to take a little bit uh, of a step back, um, the downstream effectors of P53 that are critical for the induction of apoptosis and cell cycle rest have really been well defined uh, through studies with uh, my, a gene targeted mice lacking um, critical genes. So in terms of the apoptosis in induced in response to DNA damage, it was shown that um, the BH3 proteins, Puma and uh, Noxa, are critical for uh, the apoptotic responses. So once again, thymocytes treated with gamma radiation are very sensitive and undergo apoptosis in response to, uh, to this DNA damage, whereas cell lacking, cells lacking either Puma or both Puma and Noxa are, uh, are profoundly protected to an extent almost comparable uh, to the P53 knockout cells. In terms of the cell cycle arrest induced after DNA damage, it was shown that the uh, CDK inhibitor P21 is very important for this. So once again, uh, these are mouse embryonic fibroblasts. In response to gamma radiation, there is a 50% decrease in the S phase cell compartment, whereas in cells lacking P21, they're largely protected against this arrest. P21 was also shown to be very important for the induction of senescence um, in, after DNA damage. So once again, these are colon carcinoma cell lines treated with doxorubicin. Uh, almost all wild type cells undergo senescence in response to this, but P21 deficient cells are largely protected against this. So in order to this, answer this question, which of these critical effector processes are required for Nutland's activity, I utilised mice that are lacking either one or more of these critical downstream effectors with the idea that if you knock out a critical target gene and thus process, you will lead to treatment resistance that is almost comparable to the loss of P53, or what is provided by the loss of P53. So in terms of the apoptosis induced by Nutland 3A, as I showed you before, wild-type thymocytes are very sensitive to this with 100% cell death after 24 hours. P53 uh, knockout cells are completely protected against this, and the apoptosis is via the intrinsic pathway because cells overexpressing BCL2 are um, completely protected like the P53 knockout cells. So what are the effectors uh, inducing this apoptosis? When we look at cells lacking P21, they are not protected against Nutland-induced apoptosis. Similarly, cells lacking NOXA are also not protected. However, when we look at um, thymocytes lacking the BH3-only puma, uh, protein puma, um, we see that they're strongly protected against Nutland-induced cell death. Um, while this uh, protection is complete at the earlier time points, four and eight hours, you can see at 24 hours, um, the protection provided by the loss of Puma is not equal to the loss of P53. So this suggests that there's other proteins that can contribute to nutland induced killing. In order to answer this, I started looking at um, mice lacking more than one of these critical effector genes. So mice lacking both Puma and Noxa um, show a small but significant increase in the level of protection uh, against nutland induced killing. When we look at cells from mice lacking both Puma and P21, we find uh, that the lot additional loss of P21 provides uh, no enhanced protection against Nutland-induced killing. So to sum this up, um, it, these results suggest that Puma and uh, perhaps to a lesser extent Noxa are critical for Nutland-induced um, P53 dependent killing of thymocytes in vitro. And while the data I've showed you is from thymocytes, I've um, seen similar results in mature T cells, B cells, and pre-B cells from the bone marrow. So within culture, thymocytes are all largely arrested. And so I really wanted to confirm these results in cells that are actively proliferating. And so for this, I generated uh, proliferating T lymphoblastic cells and performed cell cycle arrest and cell death analysis on them. So in response to Nutland treatment, wild-type um, lymphoblastic cells undergo this G1 arrest with a decrease in their S phase cells. 
and they also are, are sensitive to nut and 3A induced killing with 50% cell death observed after 12 hours of treatment. When we look at P53 deficient cells, as expected, uh, they are protected against nutland induced cell cycle arrest, but also apoptosis with uh, no changes in the levels of SFA cells or in the viability over the 12 hours. When we look at cells lacking P21, which is the critical cell cycle arrest uh, uh, mediator, um, they do not undergo cell cycle arrest in response to uh, nutland but they are just as sensitive as the wild type cells to nutlin induced apoptosis. In contrast to this, cells lacking puma undergo cell cycle arrest in response to nutlin, but they are profoundly protected against nutlin induced killing. When we look at cells lacking both puma and P21, we see, as expected, they do not undergo cell cycle arrest or apoptosis in response to this treatment. Uh, but it is important to note that there is no additional um, protection against uh, apoptosis afforded by the additional loss of P21. So to sum these, um, this little first mini section up, this in, uh, suggests that um, cell cycle rest and cell death can be induced by nutland 3A in lymphoid cells. However, it's only the loss of puma mediated uh, apoptosis that uh, uh, provides protection against nutland induced killing of lymphocytes. So I wanted to confirm, confirm these results in vivo. And so I treated mice either wild type or lacking these downstream critical effectors and performed qPCR tunnel and cell population analysis on them. So firstly, uh, we could see that Nutland 3A could induce um, uh, expression of P53 downstream targets in vivo. And so these are thymocytes from treated mice. And you see expression of P21, Puma, and Noxa at the mRNA level in wild type treated, but not P53 deficient, uh, P53 knockout mice, uh, suggesting this is P53 dependent um, induction of these targets. Next, looking at the functional consequences of this, um, we did tunnel staining of organs taken from wire vehicle and treated mice. And so tunnel staining involves the incorporation of labelled nucleotides onto the ends of fragmented DNA. And so this fragmentation of DNA occurs uh, in response to uh, during apoptosis. And so tunnel staining can be used uh, as a marker of apoptosis within tissues. And so this is indicated here by this brown um, colouring. And so in response to Nutland 3A, uh, the thymi from wild type mice show a strong induction in the number of uh, tunnel positive cells, indicating that Nutland 3A induces uh, th a thymocyte depletion in vivo. As expected, um, cells of mice, the thymi from mice lacking P53 are completely protected against uh, Nutland induced uh, thymic depletion in vivo. When we look at the downstream effectors and try to define which ones are critical for this, we see that in cells lacking P, or thymi from mice lacking P21, they're not protected against this depletion. You see similar levels of tunnel positive cells in uh, the thymi of P21 deficient uh, treated mice. However, when you look at mice um, deficient for puma, you see that they're largely protected against this depletion. Um, although they are not as protected as the thymi from P53 dependent, uh, P P53 deficient uh, mice. And so this really once again suggests that Puma is the critical mediator of apoptosis in response to Nutland 3A. So finally, I went on to do population, um, population analysis on treated mice. And so for this, uh, we treated mice, collected the organs, did cell counts, and then fact analysis to define the various cell populations, and used this to uh, generate total uh, population counts. So wild type, um, within wild type mice, there is a large depletion of thymocytes in response to Nutland 3A, and this correlates to about an 80 to 90% loss over 24 hours. P50, uh, <coughs> P53 deficient mice are protected against this depletion of thymocytes in vitro as expected. So looking at the effectors driving this, loss of P21 provides no protection against this. Um, you see a strong depletion in thymocytes after treatment. Loss of Noxol similarly does not provide any protection against this depletion. However, when we look at cell, uh, 
thymocytes from mice lacking puma, you can see uh, that they're largely protected against nutlin-induced depletion, once again suggesting this is a critical mediator of apoptosis after nutlin. So to sum up this, another a little brief sum up of this section, this suggests in non-transformed lymphoid cells that puma is um, the critical mediator of apoptosis induced by nutlin 3A. So while these studies give us a good insight into the mechanism of uh, Nutland 3A's activity, it's probably more interesting to look at it within a malignant context. And so one of the major things that you want about a new therapeutic is that it's selectively toxic uh, to cancer cells. And so this is one of the first questions that we really wanted to address. Then the next question we wanted to address was what are the actual critical effector processes driving therapeutic responses to Nutland in malignant cells? And so as our model of malignancy, we use the EMU-MIC transgenic mouse. So these mice overexpress the oncogene uh, MIC within their B cells, and this leads to uh, the development of B cell lymphomas in these mice, and this is evidenced by enlarged lymph nodes and enlarged spleen. So in terms of um, this first question about whether Nutlin is selectively toxic to malignant lymph uh, lymphoid cells, we can see here these are emimic lymphoma cell lines uh, with wild type P53 treated with Nutlin 3A. And you see that they are strongly or highly sensitive to Nutlin induced killing. When we compare this to the sensitivity of normal non-transformed lymphoid cells, you can see that these emimic lympho uh, lymphoma cells are uh, substantially more sensitive, uh, sensitive to killing induced by um, Nutlin. And so, this really provides us with uh, a, a nice idea that in, in the future that we'll be able to define a therapeutic window for the, uh, the use of this drug where you can clear malignant cells but leave uh, normal non-transformed lymphoid cells uh, unharmed. So from that point on, I wanted to confirm that Nutland could induce P53 accumulation and activation of its downstream targets within our emimic lymphoma, lymphoma system. So for this, I treated emimic uh, control and, emi uh, and emimic lymphoma cell lines that were lacking P53 with Nutlin and performed a, a qPCR and Western analysis. In response to treatment, you can see accumulation of P53 at the protein level in response to Nutlin 3A. Uh, and this is then followed on by induction of its targets, P21, Puma, Noxa and MDM2, both at a RNA level and at a protein level. Uh, and once again, this is P53 dependent because it does not occur in P53 deficient uh, emimic lymphoma cell lines. So in terms of the uh, effector um, processes induced by Nutland 3A within the emimic lymphomas, we see they undergo cell cycle arrest in response to Nutland with this decrease in the S phase cells, whereas the P53 deficient cells are protected against this. Emimic lymphoma cell lines are very sensitive to Nutland 3A. They undergo uh, almost 75% uh, cell death over 12 hours, whereas uh, emimic lymphoma cell lines lacking P53 are completely protected against this. So in terms of answering this question, what are the critical effectors for this uh, apoptosis induced by Nutland in, uh, in the emimic wild type cell lines? So, Loss of P21 within the emimic lymphoma cell lines provides no protection against Nutland-induced killing. And once again, neither does the loss of Noxa afford any protection against Nutland-induced killing. When we look at emimic lymphoma cell lines lacking Puma, we see that there is strong protection against Nutland-induced killing. Uh, and so at 12 hours after treatment, you still have roughly about 60% of cells remaining viable. Uh, it is important to note uh, that the loss of puma doesn't provide um, complete protection against nutland induced uh, apoptosis uh, because there's a significant difference between uh, the level of protection in the emimic pumas versus the emimic P53 knockouts. And so once again, this really suggests that there's still other critical effectors um, mediating nutland induced killing. However, despite this, I wanted to confirm these results uh, in vivo. And so for this, we used our in vivo imaging protocol. We utilised our cell lines, either emimic control or lacking P21 and Puma. We infected them uh, with a GFP luciferase construct, and this allows us to follow um, tumour growth in vivo. 
We sorted for positively infected cells and then transplanted them into albino recipients. Uh, we let the tumors, uh, tumor cells grow for seven days and then imaged these mice uh, to assess for tumor burden using luciferase bioluminescence as a marker. We then treated them for three days uh, and then uh, monitored uh, tumor progression or regression in response to treatment. So these are just vehicle-treated mice, and you can see across all three genotypes, either, lack, uh, either control or lacking P21 and Puma, they progress to a similar uh, extent in the absence of treatment. So uh, they have a similar increases in the level of um, luciferase bioluminescence over the assay. However, when amimic control tumors are treated with Nutland 3A, you see a strong regression uh, of the tumor. And so you, uh, after three days of treatment, you see almost no luciferase signal uh, being present. So what are the uh, effectors mediating this? In cells lacking P21, um, no, in, in mice bearing lymphomas lacking P21, you still see this strong regression of the tumors with almost no luciferase signaling after three days of treatment. In comparison to, or in contrast to this, uh, mice bearing emimic uh, puma deficient uh, lympho lymphomas. So you can see that they fail to regress in response to treatment, suggesting puma is critical for the regression in response to Nutland 3A. Um, it's really important to note, however, that these mice do not progress at the same rate that the vehicle treated emimic puma uh, bearing mice, puma lymphoma bearing mice do. And so once again, this really suggests that there's other effectors that can contribute to the regression um, induced by Nutland. And so as a summary uh, for my first section, I've shown both in non-transformed lymphoid cells and within uh, malignant emimic lymphoma cells that it's really apoptosis um, mediated by puma that is uh, dr driving um, responses to Nutland 3A. However, because um, the puma deficient tumors were not completely protected against uh, Nutland 3A. This suggests that there is another critical BH3 only protein uh, that is important for the apopto apoptotic responses induced by Nutland. So I might take a drink. <laughs> so for the second part of the talk, whereas the first half part of the talk where I'm really talking about what are effector processes of, of P53 are critical for uh, the regression of established tumors. The second part will be really looking at what, what um, effector processes are required to, uh, for P53 to suppress tumor formation. And so you can see here in mice lacking P53, um, they are strongly prone to cancer. They all succumb to thymic lymphoma or sarcoma by uh, before 250 days, whereas wild type mice uh, do not succumb to uh, cancer. So given the critical role of apoptosis and cell cycle rest and senescence in driving treatment responses to P53 activation, it was always considered that perhaps apoptosis on its own or uh, cell cycle rest and senescence would be the main mediators of P53 mediated tumor suppression. Um, however, a lot of work has been done with these, uh, uh, these gene trans uh, targeted mice that are lacking the effectors critical for this, and it's really brought this idea into question. So P53 mice are tumour prone, however when we look at mice lacking P21, they don't get cancer. When we look at mice lacking Noxa, similarly they don't get cancer. Mice lacking Puma, the critical effector of apoptosis downstream of P53, they don't get cancer. Mice lacking both Puma and Noxa, um, the, both the critical effectors of P53-dependent apoptosis, uh, they also don't get cancer. So this really suggests that on their own, these effector processes of apoptosis, cell cycle rest and senescence um, are unable on their own uh, to explain the way that P53 um, suppresses tumor genesis. So it was thought that perhaps maybe you would have to lose uh, multiple, uh, multiple ones of these effector processes. And so in order to probe this question, whether P21, Puma and Nox are actually critical for P53, P53 mediated tumor suppression, we generated mice lacking P21, Puma and Noxa and looked at their susceptibility to cancer. <coughs> 
So initially we needed to look uh, to confirm that cells from these mice uh, uh, behaved uh, like the single knockout, uh, single gene targeted mice did. So firstly, looking at their ability to induce apoptosis of which Puma and Noxa are the critical mediators. These are thymocytes treated with atopside and gamma radiation which induce uh, DNA damage and a, P, a strongly P53 dependent form of cell death. Wild type thymocytes are strongly sensitive to these uh, two stimuli, with 50 to 75% of cell, uh, cell death observed over 24 hours. P53 deficient thymocytes are completely protected against, or largely, or almost completely protected against this. And when we look at cells from our P2E1 Puma Noxa triple deficient mice, they're also profoundly protected against the induction of apoptosis in response to these DNA damage. Um, DNA damage inducing um, compounds or therapies. So next uh, we wanted to look at the ability for our triple knockout, uh, cells from our triple knockout mouse to undergo uh, cell cycle arrest. And so we had these proliferating T lymphoblastic cells and we treated with them with gamma radiation uh, and looked at cell cycle state. So in response to gamma radiation, wild type T lymphoblastic cells undergo a 50% decrease in their S phase cells, and this is indicative of cell cycle rest at the G1 to S boundary. Cells from mice lacking P53 are completely protected against this, and as expected, our, mice, uh, our cells from our triple knockout mice lacking P21, Puma, and Noxa, P21 being the critical effector of cell cycle rest, are also completely protected against the induction of cell cycle rest. Finally, we went on to look whether um, cells from our triple uh, knockout mice were impaired in their ability to undergo uh, cells, uh, senescence in response to um, DNA damage. And so we, ge we generated mouse dermal fibroblasts and treated them with uh, toposide for four days and looked at the induction of senescence by looking for um, beta-galactosidase positive cells, which is, um, of course, as I mentioned earlier, a marker of senescence. So you can see here by the deposition of blue crystals around the nuclei of these cells that almost 100% of um, cells, uh, wild-type cells, undergo um, senescence in response to a top side treatment, whereas cells lacking P53 are almost completely protected. It was interesting to note that while cells from our P21 Puma and Noxa triple deficient mice were profoundly uh, impaired in their ability to undergo senescence in response to Nutland 3A. They were not completely protected when compared to the P53 knockout cells. And this would actually be consistent uh, with literature that suggests that there's other P53 dependent um, genes such as PML and PAI1, which are also important for the induction of senescence. So cells from our mice are, are, are lack, uh, impaired in their ability or lacking in their ability to undergo senescence, cell cycle arrest, and they're profoundly impaired in their ability to undergo senescence. So are they tumor prone? So P53 deficient mice are cancer prone uh, with uh, succumbing to thymic lymphoma by 250 days of age, while wild type cells are not, a wild type mice are not. When we look at our triple deficient mice, once again, despite uh, losing uh, activity on all these pathways, they're, all, they're not cancer prone. And so this is really quite remarkable and it really suggests that uh, transcriptional induction of P21, Puma and Noxa and hence the induction of apoptosis cell cycle rest and to a large extent the, the induction of senescence actually not essential for P53 mediated tumor suppression. And this is kind of... Um, generate a lot of excitement in the field. So if it's not these absolutely essential uh, downstream targets, what is it? So at the same time that uh, we were doing this work, uh, two papers were published. The first of these was from Laura Tardy's lab uh, at Stanford, and they generated a P53 knock-in mouse with mutations in the first transactivation domain of P53. They had impaired expression of P21 Puma and Noxa, and they were uh, un uh, impaired in their ability to undergo apoptosis and cell cycle rest. However, they weren't tumor prone, and as a response to this, uh, they uh, concluded that perhaps senescence was critical for tumor suppression. Um, a year later, however, another paper was published with another P53 knock in mouse, this time with mutations to three lysine residues. They had impaired induction of Puma and P21 and impaired induction of apoptosis cell cycle rest, but as well as senescence as well. 
these mice, once again, weren't tumour prone, and so this led them to um, the conclusion that the coordination of metabolism may be critical for P53 dependent tumour suppression. However, there was one major caveat to these two studies, and it kind of really limited how much people were willing to take um, from this. And so it was that p expression of these critical uh, targets, P21, Puma, and Noxa, was substantially reduced but not completely abrogated. And so people are, uh, it was argued that residual expression of these genes within these mice was sufficient to, uh, to actually suppress tumours. So the work that I've done and showed you today with these triple deficient mice really um, go, uh, kind of answers this question to beyond any doubt. These mice completely lacks Puma, Noxa and P21, uh, are the critical effectors of apoptosis, cell cycle arrest and senescence, and they're not tumour prone. So this really suggests that these are not essential for P53 mediated tumour suppression. So of course, um, the big question is, what is it? And so while other groups suggested perhaps metabolism might be important, we thought um, DNA repair might be an interesting um, process to look at, <coughs> given the fact that uh, genomic instability is really a hallmark of cancer. So in order to uh, validate this as a potentially important process, we needed to, com to confirm that cells from our P21 Puminox are triple deficient mice retain the ability to properly coordinate DNA repair. And so to do this, uh, we looked at fibroblasts and um, or mouse dermal fibroblasts and looked at their ability to form uh, gamma H2X foci and uh, resolve them after DNA damage. So the formation of gamma H2A uh, foci um, occurs at uh, double uh, DNA strand breaks and can be used as a marker of DNA lesions and at their resolution can be used as a reflection of DNA repair. When we looked in unstressed conditions, we actually found quite an interesting and surprising result that while wild type uh, and triple deficient cells had no gamma H2X foci present, in the P53 deficient cells, there was a, a certain uh, proportion of them which already had low levels uh, of foci present. And this maybe perhaps suggests that even in the absence of stress, um, P53 deficient cells are impaired in their ability to coordinate DNA damage. When we stress these cells by um, treating or with them with gamma radiation, we see that the early response to this across all three genotypes is fairly similar. Um, we see that, uh, this pan-nuclear accumulation of gamma H2X foci, um, which I forgot to mention is in green. Um, and, and so across all three genotypes, they behave fairly similarly. However, when we looked uh, at a kind of later, uh, later time point, at six hours after irradiation, we saw that there was a clear difference between our wild type and our P53 deficient fibroblasts. While the wild type fibroblasts, um, this pan-nuclear gamma H2X staining, had kind of really condensed into these discrete foci, and this um, suggests that DNA repair is um, beginning to occur within these cells, the P53 deficient cells still retain this pan-nuclear uh, gamma H2X foci. Um, being present, suggesting once again coordination of DNA repair is impaired in the P53 deficient uh, fibroblasts. When we looked at the triple deficient cells, we saw that they uh, were very much similar to the, the, um, P, uh, the wild type cells with these kind of discrete foci, suggesting that um, cells from our triple deficient mice uh, retain the ability to coordinate DNA repair. We went on to quantitate this and uh, this is a quantitation of cells with high levels of damage, and so this is greater than 40 foci per nuclei. And so while I said before that P53 deficient cells have low levels of um, foci present, um, in untreated conditions this will not show up on this quantitation because we're looking at high levels of damage. At one hour after irradiation, cells from all three genotypes behave fairly similar with a high accumulation of these highly uh, damaged cells. Whereas when we look at six hours, the P53 deficient cells uh, have a trend to the uh, uh, persistence of these uh, highly damaged cells, once again suggesting coordination of DNA repair is impaired. So finally, uh, as P53 is known as a, a transcription factor and it's really been shown to be important for uh, the expression of a whole range of DNA repair genes, I wanted to confirm that um, cells from our P21 Puma Noxa triple deficient mice um, retain the ability to um, normally express these cells, um, these genes, sorry about that. Uh, and so 
for this, we performed a qPCR analysis on th thymocytes after, gamma, uh, after they were treated with gamma radiation. And so, in response to treatment of these DNA uh, with gamma radiation, uh, wild type shells show strong induction in, um, P in these DNA re repair genes. And in particular, um, the strongest uh, ones that are upregulated are DDIT4, ERCC5, MGM2, and POLK whereas P53 deficient cells are unable to induce expression of um, these genes at their mRNA level. When we look at the triple deficient cells, we see that they retain wild type um, ability to upregulate these DNA repair genes. Um, so as a control, um, we looked at uh, the expression of uh, P53 dependent um, known P50, oh, well-characterised P53 target genes. And so in response to gamma radiation, as expected, you get expression of P21 Puma and Noxerin wild-type cells. Um, as a nice control, you see no expression in our P21 Puma Noxa um, triple deficient cells of these three uh, genes. Uh, and expression of these uh, is impaired, it does not occur in the P53 deficient cells. When we look at uh, a gene that should not be affected by the loss of Puma, Noxa, and P21, um, we see that wild type ability to express this. And so I guess um, to sum this up, um, cells from our P21, Puma, Noxa, triple deficient mice, which are not tumor prone, retain the ability to coordinate DNA repair. Whereas cells from P53 deficient mice, which are tumor prone, um, are really impaired in their ability to coordinate DNA repair. Um, and so we think this really uh, constitutes an interesting process for further research uh, in terms of P53 mediated tumor suppression. As a final summary, uh, despite uh, the critical importance of apoptosis cell cycle arrest and senescence to acute responses to DNA damage, they seem to be not essential for P53 mediated tumour suppression. And so what the field really needs to do now is focus on these underappreciated processes such as coordination of DNA repair, uh, coordination of metabolism, or perhaps uh, even uh, currently unknown uh, P53 um, controlled uh, effector processes as, as being the ones critical for tumour suppression. So, um, just... <laughs> so, <laughs> this is the group. Um, I'd like to thank Andreas. Uh, Andreas is an amazing supervisor. He's um, always present and available for contact when you're having problems, giving you new ideas. Um, I... I, I I think he, he, I would define him as the perfect um, PhD supervisor. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd also like to thank uh, Philippe, who's my second, uh, secondary supervisor, and Jerry Adams. Um, they've been there for a lot of support and input in uh, both of my projects. Anna Yannick and um, uh, Daniel Gray were uh, both heavily involved in the triple knockout story. Marco and Gemma were uh, very important for the uh, Nutland story. Marco generated the Puma, no, the Puma, uh, the GFP luciferase construct uh, that allowed us to do the in vivo imaging, uh, whereas uh, Gemma Kelly really um, worked on uh, defining the protocol for the in vivo imaging. Lorraine, um, lots of advice and reagents for her across the years. Um, the, the, the rest of the Strasser Lab and the M MGC division are incredibly important to me. They make coming into work um, not a chore, uh, and it's, they provide such an amazing uh, research environment to work within. I'd like to thank Claire, Scott, Ever, uh, Michelak and Lena Happo. Uh, they provided both uh, cell lines for me to use, and Claire and Ever originally started the Puma P21 crosses uh, that I continued on with. Uh, for all the fiberglass work that I showed you, Nima um, taught me the protocol for uh, generating them and provided reagents for that. Um, Andreas mentioned this, um, but we had an incredibly important collaboration with Lubomir Vasilev, who was at Roche, but is now at Merck Serrano. Um, Without him, we wouldn't have been able to do any of the in vivo Nutland experiments. They provided us the drug for free. And so I'm very thankful for that collaboration. From Peter Mack, uh, Ricky Johnson and Andrea Newbold uh, provided us with cell lines. Uh, Yigal and Camille um, taught me all the, and provided reagents for uh, the uh, senescence assays that I showed you today. Uh, Alex Egley and Josephina Hofbauer um, 
on the other side of the world, um, at the same time generated Puma P21 double deficient mice and kind of really confirmed our results with this. Um, None of our work happens without our support services. So I'd like to thank our, all, all my animal technicians over the years, uh, our genotypers who save us so much time, Callie Rogers and Cameron from the imaging facility um, for help with uh, in the in vivo imaging and also the microscopy work from both of these projects. Um, both facts and histology were heavily used and of course Jason and Jasmine for running all our bleeds. And so I'm happy to take any questions at this point. We've got plenty of time for questions. Matt. So you mentioned coordination metabolism has been implicated in the, the oncogenesis. Um, what is that and have you looked at it in the mice? So we haven't followed up with the uh, coordination of metabolism at this point, but P53 has been shown um, for um, the induction of various genes uh, that are critical for metabolism, like TIGA and GLIS2. And so it's thought through uh, induction of those, uh, they can pr uh, prevent uh, like ROS accumulation and that kind of stuff. And so then that could potentially drive uh, further DNA mutations through uh, ROS-mediated uh, DNA damage. And do you know the actual what the lesions are in the P53 knockouts? You know, do you know if there's DNA damage repair, this is initiating oncogenic lesions, right? Do you know what they are? So this would be just mutations of various genes that are critical um, for the suppression of tumor. So, I mean, if there's been shown that, um, so mutation of various DNA repair genes uh, inactivating their function could um, promote further, uh, I'll rethink that question though. Yeah, that kind of stuff, so, yeah. Is it possible to look using your genetic approach at the role of DNA repair? Is there any knockout mice that you can use that are, that are viable that you might be able to use? Yeah, so there's quite a range of them. So uh, um, genes such like GAD45, uh, FANC, there's a whole kind of panel of these um, knockout mice that we could utilise and kind of uh, cross onto them. There's also kind of ones um, with deficiencies upstream in the recognition of DNA damage that you can use, so like ATM and ATR um, deleted mice. Um, at this point, because we kind of view that DNA repair is a, an interesting target, but maybe it's not the only one, we're trying, uh, the way that the lab is going ahead with this is more in an unbiased approach. And so um, at the moment we're doing uh, in vivo shRNA screens about, against P53 um, targets and seeing loss of which um, P53 dependent genes actually promotes tumor genesis and hoping this will give us a, a, a less biased kind of way to answer this question of which genes are important. Joan, and then Suzanne. Um, so, so you indicated that there are these critical um, DNA repair genes that are upregulated as part of P53's um, ability to suppress tumor formation. But it seems unlikely that the mechanism for that upregulation would be through transcription. So do you have any alternative suggestions for how P53 might be regulating their expression? Um, so I, I don't understand why they wouldn't be. Well, if, if um, so, so the ability to regulate the um, P21 for the <coughs> noxus is insufficient to mediate P53's role. Oh, but they can still carry on. I see. So there's a yeah, I understand. So there's a subset of genes that are upregulated. They don't contribute to tumor suppression. Yeah. Yeah. So it's another set that are. Yeah. And, and they do. So I, I guess at the moment the P53 field is thinking that there's distinct transcriptional profiles between what is required for tumour suppression and maybe perhaps um, within the stress events that are important for tumour suppression, P21 Puma and Octa may not even be induced or perhaps um, uh, the... So one of the ways that I've been thinking about it is perhaps these kind of events that are important for tumour suppression are very quick. and so. Um, P53 might induce Puma and P21, but they're never expressed for long enough for them to actually have a functional consequence. 
And so this is something that I'm really interested in following up and looking at under different stresses, what does the P53 transcriptional profile look like? Is it actually different in, in terms of what is required for tumour suppression versus these kind of strong, acute kind of things? Because I think we can't use them as a good marker of P53 activity anymore. Sue and then Yvonne. Yeah, I think I'd first like to congratulate you to your brilliant talk. I think you made a P50, very complex P53 story very easy to follow, so well done. But I have a question on your uh, nothing experiments on the EUMIC. So you showed that the lymphonas of the EUMIC mice sort of um, are uh, inhibited with nothing 3A treatment, but the pre B cells and B cells weren't affected. So what happens to other, because we have B cells obviously are usually not cycling within the normal mouse, so what happens to other cells that are actually sort of in cell cycle and would those also be affected by? Yeah, so we haven't looked directly at this, um, but the original xenograph models, they actually looked at not only what was happening with the uh, human cancer cell lines, but they actually did post-mortems on the mice. Uh, and so they show, showed that things like uh, the gastrointestinal cells, which are highly proliferating, will be um, affected by Nutland 3A. But these are uh, really high doses, and so maybe if you kind of uh, dose down this, you'll kind of inhibit the, um, the effects on these cells, or limit them, I guess. Here you go. Hey John, congratulations, beautiful work. Thank you. Um, so the peptide not that mice develop lymphoid malignancies is larger than teeth. So going back to the last bit of your um, talk, do you think that the driving force there is that these cells are more sensitive to DNA damage because of the range, et cetera, and that triggers that DNA repair in there? Or at the other hand, are uh, deficient in the ability to respond to that? <coughs> I think it might be both because I mean within that rearrangement process maybe it's not com uh, it's not uh, perfect all the time and so P53 being able to kind of recognise when it hasn't gone perfectly and kind of initiating D DNA repair at these kind of points might actually be critical uh, like the critical time and events when this occurs so it could be either or I think. Though I would assume that that impairment we are carrying I'm sorry, I'm not getting <coughs> that inability to repair would be true to <coughs> other cells like the digestive system with this exposure. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, I, uh, maybe we can talk about this later. But yeah, the question is why there is such a strong side. <coughs> Yeah. Um, I guess it's not really known at this point of time why there is such a strong selection to lymphoid malignancies. Yeah. Okay. First, Mark, and then Matt. Um, have you been able to generate back to back double knockout lymphomas to test to see if not um yeah, if, if those lymphomas are completely refractory to nutland. And I suppose a second question along those same lines, and maybe at the risk of, uh, of uh, incurring Strauss's wrath, do you think that there's an element of, of truth in what Doug Green published a long time ago in terms of the <laughs> 53 being a direct inducer of, uh, of cell death? So in terms of the first question, no, we haven't generated the emimic um, backbacks. Uh, I think it might be a little bit difficult um, to do that given uh, that the backbacks on their own are very difficult to breed and then crossing them onto the emimic. So in terms of um, P53 as a direct um, inducer of apoptosis, um, <laughs> <laughs> She's too polite. <laughs> um, uh, uh, to, truthfully, I don't, I don't really see it and I understand it. Um, so, the work that I didn't get to you to show you today is um, that there seems to be, in terms of this kind of, um, actually, no, that's not going to answer it. <laughs> so. 
this idea of P53 translocating then to the mitochondria and uh, forcing, I, I, I don't really believe it. I mean, <laughs> P53, it, it's essential as a, I mean, when you're looking at these differences, there are very small differences in the paper. So if it's going to be something, it's only going to be a very small effect. <laughs> uh, just, a, just a detailed question. On all of your experiments compared nut in 3A to vehicle, but one of the first slides you showed can compare nut in 3A to nut in 3B. What is nut in 3B? Um, so nut in 3A is formed as a, 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 I can't remember the word, anatoma. There's two versions of them. And so uh, nut in 3B is the inactive for, a version of it, whereas nut in 3A is the active version. So it's kind of like a null version of it, but we couldn't get access to that. Do, um, do different P53 mutations um, affect nutlin binding? So if you have a P53 um, mutation, uh, the nutlins don't work. Um, this is because uh, most of the P53 mutations impair DNA binding. Um, so the nutlins wouldn't necessarily uh, have different they would still impair MDM2 within um, when you've got mutant P53, but uh, that it still doesn't work on them. Final question by Tim. Uh, <coughs> I, I guess in your interview bit, the fiber lines, they would, which are not P53 null, they would probably be, I think, for AR null, or put it another way, it's not that it's not that they're affecting themselves, which I guess I think for AR. Uh, we haven't looked at that, really. But it would be something to maybe perhaps look at in the future. OK, well, right on time. It remains to thank Liz for a very clear, very interesting seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.